stressed principle. So he or she, normally he, who was the first to make a claim of occupation and therefore a record in the register became the quote-unquote lawful owner. So these are key concepts. The land is conquered. The register becomes the proof of ownership, not possession anymore. And possession uh, is a right of a citizen which can be taken away and it's normally first in best dressed. It's a claim. It's a race. Now the Romans had one proviso on this and it was the most fundamental rule which they never permitted to be broken. No one could claim occupation of a sacred site sacred land. No one could claim occupation of a sacred site, sacred land, such as a temple. If they did, and it doesn't matter what religion it was, if anyone did, that Roman citizen would be executed, their family sold into slavery, and their estates broken up. It didn't matter who they were. It was the one of the worst crimes against the Roman Empire, the Roman law system, to to occupy sacred land. And it was honoured and has been honoured up until the last hundred years or so. Certainly less and less as we move forward. But it is an intrinsic rule that stays on the books from the very beginning. Now, another important thing about the Roman system is that the Romans, when they did a survey, they didn't care about the land. Now, one of the big lies about the Romans is that the Romans were great at land. They weren't great at land management at all. They were terrible at land management, and they still are. It's why there were so many famines across the Roman Empire. Because they, in fact, and they can prove that the Romans were terrible at land management because they came up with a terrible idea. And the idea they came up with was usufruct. So when land was occupied and claim occupied then it was a, it was a private ownership it was a form of absolute ownership and anyone else had usufruct and usufruct uses uses which again uses uses comes back to the time of Tara but uses fructus fructus where we get fruit is the fruits of the land and the concept is very simple that anyone that is uh, living on that land that does not own the land can still reap the benefits of the land even though, even though they're not the owners. And this is how they accommodated possession while at the same time claiming occupation. But it also gave the Romans an advantage. It meant when their legions were marching through, they could strip the fields, they could take whatever they needed, and it was perfectly lawful. Now, of course, th this was abused and constantly abused throughout the age of the Roman Empire and why there was so much famine. And usus fructus or user fruct still exists today. It is an insane concept. But the Romans, when they did their survey, they did not survey the land contrary to what they claim. They surveyed the roll. They surveyed the register. And when they did a survey register, they called it the census. Now, there's some more information in there just to let you know about how the provinces were structured. In the Roman time, it was the rector provincia. When you read history books, you'll be told that the um, heads of provinces were the governors. There is no such word in Latin as governor. It's a complete lie. You'll be told, no, sorry, that was a mistake. They were the tribune or they were a consul or they were a praetor. Look, Consuls, praetors are like uh, lieutenants and generals and the concept of being uh, the head of a province is like being the head of a military base. Yes, I can be a general and the head of a military base, but I could also be a colonel, lieutenant colonel. I could be at the head of the military base, so I could be a four-star general. So just to say that one has to be a general to control a base is absurd. So just in the modern terms, as you have an office, a position, and a rank, the Romans had exactly the same thing. They invented it. So that's exactly the same thing. But the official role of a head 
of the province was called the rector, and they still are the most powerful positions. Next to the rector, we had the role called the, um, the curator, and the curator means manager, keeper, overseer, custodian. The most important role was the keeper of the roles, custos rotolorum, both the slave roles and the, and the roles of the land, which were then surveyed through a census. And given the census was such an important function, once every seven years, in honour of Tara, along would come a censor, a visitor of immense authority. And the censor would visit and would survey the roles. If the roles were out of order, the rector and the, cust the, the uh, uh, curator could be in deep trouble. They could lose their positions they could be banished, and if they really were bad, they could be tried and executed. So the censor had enormous power then, as they do today. Now, I know there's many, many chats about the Jesuits and how the Jesuits structure and how the Jesuits run the world. It may not surprise you that since 1540, the Jesuits have rebuilt the Roman provincial system on the same model. And the rector is the most powerful position of a province. And the rectors live in universities. The curator, also known as the superior, is the uh, custos rotolorum, the keeper of the roles, and still is the keeper of the roles of vital statistics. And the censor still travels around and checks that the whole system is running properly. Although the censor now is more often called the visitor, from Latin visito, meaning literally to go with strength, authority, power and force. And if you want to see the provinces of the world today by which the world is structured, please have a look under Home Land La. Because what I'm saying, there's an enormous amount here to, to go through. Now, why are all these things important? If I want to defend my property against a system that is ignorant at the lower level, I have to accept a number of facts. First, I'm probably not going to get much use or help out of the lower level courts until they start to learn and grow up and until a few heads have been knocked off uh, by their own system until they get beaten back into shape. In the short term, I'm probably going to get the same kind of comfortable ignorance that we discussed at the opening of the show. However, as I move through the ranks, higher up I go, they will know that the entire land system, that it is a Roman land system, is based on principles. And knowing now the importance of occupation, the importance of possession, the importance of sacred land, the importance of survey, these things become very, very important in the remedies that I may choose. Now, I'll mention one more element of, of land history and then I'll move on because of time to, tonight. And I appreciate uh, your patience in letting me go through this. I'm just going to mention the concept of uh, lend, lend or lend, from which we get land created by the Pippins, the Pippin Knights or the Franks, such as Charlemagne. And when uh, Lend, Lend was created, they created a concept known as tenant and tenancy from the Latin tenere, meaning to hold or keep, one who holds land by tenure. Now, what makes this significant is the Franks were the ultimate Christian knights and they believed that a system of honour and respect was the best system to sustain society. So they are the ones that coined our, our word is our bond and that there is an equality and a fairness required throughout the system. And they were great innovators because of that. And when they created the lease, they built into the concept of the lease two fundamental remedies to anyone that is a tenant. It is the right of equity and the right of redemption. And we know the system knows of this 
Because when they created the wholly corrupted and awful perversion of the mortgage, they also created the concept of equity of redemption to pretend that they still honoured it in theory so that they weren't in dishonour. Why? Because a tenant and a tenancy agreement is not valid if it does not contain the right of equity and redemption. It is not a tenancy agreement. It is an invalid agreement if it does not contain the rights built in to the word of equity and redemption. Now, what's equity and redemption? Equity and redemption means that when you are brought before a court, that court must be able to hear a matters of equity if it is discussing anything to do with you effectively being a tenant. That court cannot arbitrate on land, cannot lawfully arbitrate on land if there's not a court of equity. Now, they get around it by saying, well, you give up your rights, so we'll talk about it as property. Or you give up your right, we'll talk about it as a loan. Land discussions between a landlord and a tenant. And if you have a mortgage, you are a tenant. If there is property tax paid in your area, you are a tenant. If you do not hold legal title, you are absolutely a tenant. How can you be otherwise? And if you do hold legal title and the state demands you pay taxes, then clearly you're a tenant to the state as well. You are always a tenant. Always. So unless the court is a court of equity, it is not permitted to hear on matters of tenancy, which is why they don't want you to ever admit you're a tenant. Ever. The second is redemption. And what's redemption mean? If you fall into dishonour as a long-term tenant, you have the absolute right for consideration and to make good, to restore your honour. If you are a tenant in dishonour, you are a tenant that is in delinquency. Why do you think the banks don't want you to pay any more money once you fall behind? Go to a bank after you've fallen behind on two payments and see what happens. No, we don't want your money. Well, Hold on a sec. You, you, I've been paying these mortgage repayments and now you're telling me you don't want my money? Why would a bank not want your money? Doesn't seem normal, does it? Why? Because they have to get you into a position of delinquency. Why? Because they have to eliminate these rights of equity and redemption. Now, it is, it is a fraud, foreclosure, and, and, and non-judicial hearings. No one can claim it's lawful. It is wholly unlawful to remove tenants from their tenancy without a hearing. It is absolute fraud. And if you want proof that the system is broken, there you have it. In a moment, we'll be talking about how we will be responding, exactly how we're responding and responding and the strength of what we're doing as responding. Because I don't want anyone to feel that what we're doing is uh, blowing in the wind. But it's important to understand the principles first before you move on to the remedy, before you move on to the follow-up and, and dishonour. The reality is that redemption should allow you to redeem your position if you are in dishonour. And that is why that one of the first remedies that we're discussing on this site is the remedy of the tenant. Now, there'll be more in terms of the hearing and the documents that go with the hearing and a counterclaim. Now, in a counterclaim, there are a number of tools that are available to you. The tools of discovery, the tools of interrogatory. The interrogatories are extremely important and have been much maligned in the process, mainly because I think people have been uncertain how to use interrogatories to their advantage. But with the knowledge we're discussing, interrogatories become extremely powerful. And I will be discussing how powerful when we talk about writs in a moment. Now, I'm mindful again of time, so I'm going to move forward to claiming the land to show a practical example of what we're discussing. Then I want to talk about writs, and I want to talk about uh, very quickly about what's coming up in terms of saving and helping community. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm looking